William Faulkner knew that all your dumb excuses for not writing are a bunch of BS. And what's scary about writers in the modern world is that most of them don't even write. And even worse, most of them don't structure their entire life around the writing, even though they tell everyone that they are a writer. And today we are going to hear everybody, William Faulkner speak at length on what it takes, what mentality you need to have to overcome writer's block and all the excuses you have to not showing up to the page for hours a day. Because if you aren't sitting down at a table for four hours plus a day, then you have screwed up and then and you really aren't taking yourself very seriously as an author. But if you guys don't already know, Right Conscious is the headquarters of everything related to William Faulkner here on YouTube. If you look at that playlist down below, you will see an ever-blossoming library of videos on Faulkner that is growing every single week. So I would personally love to have you on this journey with me. But enough from me, everybody. Let us now hear from Faulkner. Quote, you can always find time to write. Anybody who says he can't is living under false pretenses. To that extent, depend on in inspiration. Don't wait. When you have an inspiration, put it down. Don't wait until later and when you have more time, and then try to recapture the mood and add flourishes. You can never recapture the mood with the vividness of its first impression. And Faulkner is 100% correct here. And he speaks to one of the most important things you need to do as a writer, which is you need to be able to have time to write whenever you need to. And a lot of you guys maybe don't have jobs that let you write when you need to. Maybe you work construction or something that's very active. Maybe you're a waiter or something like that. I know my boy Shane, who's a big fan of the show, is the guy who stands as security at the art museum. You know, I don't think he can pull out the notepad on the wall and start writing. And there are also a ton of you guys who have families and lives and you can't just suddenly abandon little Johnny's soccer game and go start writing. But as Faulkner just said, the first impression is the most vivid. And this is how I feel about YouTube videos. I've discovered this about poetry and about any type of art. Every single day I go out to the desert and I try to work on some desert poetry or just spend time out there to kind of get a better relationship for future writing endeavors. But sometimes I'm writing a poem and I'm halfway through and I have to go. Like I, there's some appointment I have to go get to. And if that poem's half finished, if I try to go sit down at my desk later and finish it, it's never as good. The vibe doesn't fit. If I go out to the desert again and try to finish it, it never works. Sometimes I get lucky and can kind of sneak some lines in there and conclude it really fast and no one really knows that the vibe shifted, but I know. And I know what it could have been if I stayed out there for however much longer. Same with YouTube videos. I don't, I wake up every morning, I'm like, who do I wanna talk about? Because if I script out a video, I don't even script videos, but if I plan a quote or I plan a video, I may wake up and be like, dude, I wanna talk about Faulkner today. And so if you have a job, if you have a family life that doesn't allow you to write when you want to write, then let's start with the first step, which is start stop adding a bunch of shit into your life that is not supporting you as a writer because your excuses are your own fault. If you married somebody who doesn't support your artistic dreams and understand the idea of inspiration and having to go do something, then you screwed up. And I'm not saying divorce your wife, but if you have a job that doesn't allow you to write or is so intense that you don't have energy to write after work, you screwed up. Because William Faulkner wrote, as a lay dying, at, as a coal shoveler at a power plant in six weeks. He would shovel coal for like eight hours and then sit for four hours while still on duty and write his novel. Do you have that type of commitment? Do you think William Faulkner cared if he got fired in that situation? Do you think if he got fired, he would have been, oh, don't fire me? Or would he have just left and continued writing the novel and made it a bestseller? Where do you think that burning desire came from? Because that burning desire can transcend anything. And I have a burning desire right now to help you get deeper into Faulkner's works. So I have created a free guide down below. It's in a Google Doc that details where you should start with William Faulkner's works, depending on what type of writer you are. I also rank William Faulkner's novels. And I list some of William Faulkner's favorite books, favorite authors, and some of his inspirations. And so if you guys want to kind of fast track getting into Faulkner or just kind of learn what I think Faulkner's greatest novels are, you can go check that out down below. 
but let us get back to the video. And here are five practical tips to be able to find more time for inspiration because unfortunately, so like I said, don't double down on new things that take up more time of your life and like make it harder. Don't get a more intense job. Don't have another kid. Don't get two more dogs if, if you're already bogged down and you are unwilling to have that conversation that, you know, the adult conversation because I know a lot of men and a lot of women who are just dishonest in their relationships and never say when something's wrong. They don't take themselves seriously because they've never attained success. And it's a very sad thing. Like I have a buddy out there and he makes films and makes like little small films, but his wife never takes him seriously because he's never blown up or done anything big. When he wants to spend some of their money on one of his films or go out and travel or do something related to the film, she always shoots it down because he's never shown her anything, even though he's made films that are, I think, pretty good. And so if you're unwilling to have a conversation like that, and even if you are, here are five different times that you can squeeze in every single day to find more time for inspiration because a magical thing can happen when you are sitting down at the desk and then you feel inspired. When you give yourself that time, like for whatever reason, I woke up today and I'm more awake than I have been for the last couple of days. Let's go. I haven't done no caffeine. I'm just, I'm feeling that way because I give myself time every single day. And so the first time is before work. Wake up earlier than everybody else in your household. Right now, it is 6.15 in the morning. I was up at 5 a.m. getting ready for this video and the other ones I'm about to film. And before I got ready for that, I translated a poem for my upcoming book. My family, my three cats, they're all sleeping right now. No one's awake. And speaking of early, a good thing that you can do also is let's say your house is chaotic. It's not really the best thing. You can always show up to work 30 minutes early. You can, I don't want to say lie, but you can say, hey, I have a bunch of work I have to do and I need to get there early. And I do this all the time. You know, my clock in time for my work is 830. I get there at 8 a.m. And for those 30 minutes, maybe I plan for my job. But a lot of the time I just do a lot of journaling, a lot of planning and sometimes some writing. Another time you could do this is your lunch break. A lot of people's lunch breaks are hanging out with the boys or going to get some food. Pre-make your lunch, meal prep. And if you're at a job where like there's nowhere to go, go sit in your car and write. If you can't write, read. If you can't do any of that, just think. Listen to some music. Do a, Put on a meditation and just try to clear your mind. Do whatever you can to gain more energy back and kind of interact with the deeper levels of self. And then you could do this after work also. The other day, my wife was um, out with some friends in the city and... I work at a school with only one way in and one way out. So there's just a massive traffic jam for like 45 minutes. And so I just never try to leave with them. And so I was sitting there writing this poem, working on some of my translations. And I got in this vibe. I suddenly was just like rolling and I was feeling it. And I just kept going and I kept going. And the janitors are cleaning the room. They're vacuuming. I'm just going, going, going. And my wife eventually calls me and she's like, I'm home. It's seven o'clock. Where are you? What are you doing? I'm like, oh my God, I'm still at work. And I was just rolling. I put on some ambient music. I wasn't even looking at the clock because I don't have a personal phone. My wife had to call my work phone because I wasn't checking my email. And the same goes for staying up later. You can stay up later. And like I said, I sleep is important, but what's more important? your writing or your sleep. If you want to become a great writer, unfortunately, you're going to have to miss out on some sleep. You're going to have to maybe pick up some unhealthy habits for a while. If you are younger and you have a bunch of time or you, you have a bunch of time, then you don't need to do that. But if you're managing a career, a family, even a workout routine and other things, yeah, you're going to have to make some sacrifices. And as I talk about all the time, if you sleep eight hours a night and you work 40 hours a week, you still have 70 hours a week of free time. And so writing two hours a day, which I think is a great start and I think is enough to make decent amount of progress is 100% doable. And let me hear your excuses down in the chat. Why can you not write two hours a day? How, how is your schedule so filled up that you do not have two hours a day to write, especially with the tactics I just talked about? Let's hear it. Let, let your excuses flood the chat right now. Because if we take on the methodology of the literary renaissance, which is to spend a couple thousand hours revising a novel, because the literary greats most of the time spend over 5,000 hours writing one of their novels, but they are trying to reach the literary heights. You, hopefully, as if you saw my video on why people don't care about your writing, are trying to write a transformative novel or piece of uh, a poetry collection. And for a poetry collection, I would say that that's more near 1,000 hours. And for a fiction collection, maybe 2,500 to 3,000 hours. And so if you write two hours a day, and let's say a little bit more some days, let's say you get 800 hours in a year. Well, that would put you at about three years to get a good novel out. And during that time with a little extra work, you could be building up your Substack audience. You could be building up your email list over there. You could be getting some traction over on social media. And then three now, three years from now, when you launch your book, you're not going to be like 99% of writers who boo-hoo because no one reads their stuff and have an actual book launch. And to just remind people, because this is important, 
there's something which I call the evil exit, which is an unfortunate thing. And it's hard to gauge, but if you do feel like you have some pot potential as a writer, if you actually feel like you have a burning desire to do this and aren't just making excuses for a life you don't like, then let's say you cause some problems in your family. Let's say you divorce your wife or you quit your job and all, these, all this chaos and pain occurs. But on the flip side, you help tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. Was it worth it? And a lot, we've been morally programmed to say, no, it's not worth it. Never do that. And I would agree, like, you know, the breakdown of the nuclear family, people bailing out is like a huge problem. But I'm not saying bail out on accountability and responsibility and connection. But I am saying if you are in a toxic environment or an environment that doesn't support you, and you do feel like you have that push, you have that desire, then sometimes you just need to be the evil person and leave. Before, before I started this channel, I was in a relationship for years that was so wild that I couldn't get anything done. None of my dreams, none of my writing. And we had so many shared assets and connections and so many different things. And I was okay with the relationship, but I wasn't okay with what it was doing to my potential. And so if I stayed in there and I stayed the good guy, if I followed what I was told to do by all the people, stick it out, it's okay, this is just a part of life. I first of all, wouldn't have helped now tens of thousands of readers and writers activate themselves. I wouldn't have met my wife, which is who is a way better partner, and I wouldn't have been forced to kind of grow up and mature as a man in the ways that I have. But I had to deal with not just a whole friend group, but an entire community that I was a part of viewing me as this evil, terrible person. I had to deal with going places and like seeing someone that I had known for years and saying, hey, what's up? And them like not talking to me. So are you ready for that? And I would encourage you to take that step. If you truly believe that you can do this, you, if you truly believe that you are a part of the literary crusade and aren't just afraid that you're not just going to be a writer, but you all are also going to be an advocate for other writers and for yourself and understand that you're writing transformational stuff. And for everyone who is going through something like this, whether it's a job, whether it's a relationship or whatever, I started speaking out loud. It sounds crazy, but I would just say out loud, I'm the most evil person in the world. You know, I'm doing it. I'm going to ruin everything. I'm going to ruin my credit. I'm going to ruin this. It's all over. Doesn't matter. No one's worse than me. I'm going to hell. And then I would hear myself and be like, dude, this is so funny. Like, this doesn't matter. Like, in the long run, like, why does any of this matter? None of it matters. Because inside our own heads, it seems like this complex wit maze. But when I heard it out loud and I, like, kind of took myself out of the situation, I was like, hmm, how is this? Actually? That sounds silly. No, you're not evil, Ian. It doesn't matter. And so I believe in each and every one of you. I will see you guys out on the battlefield of the literary crusade. Go check out some of the links in the description down below if you guys want to hang out with me and join me over in the free writing school. You want to see my guide on Faulkner and everything else down there. And I will see you guys very soon in the next video.